This is a study that we've just finished doing up at the ANU where we've looked at um, the predictive power of dietary patterns uh, for new depression in people in different age groups, 20, 40s and 60s, in the large path through life study at the ANU. And we found that only in the older people, the younger people we didn't see this, but in the older people, dietary patterns predicted their risk for depression over time. So those who had higher levels of this Western type dietary pattern and lower levels of this prudent, healthy dietary pattern were at greater risk of depression over time. We took into account, we're very interested in this study to look at residual confounding. You know, what is really, if you drill right down into it, the explanatory fact, um, power of socioeconomic variables to explain this? Because we know that people who are worse off socioeconomically eat worse and they're also at increased risk for depression. So in this study, we looked in great detail at measures of social circumstances and financial hardship and poverty in childhood and all sorts of things. And we found that these relationships existed over and above that. And we also, have I got it in here? No. Uh, what we also did too was to look at cardiovascular risk factors and say, okay, so if there's this, this link, if, if depression, if dietary patterns at the start predict depression over time, is it working through cardiovascular risk factors? And then we did find some evidence for that, although it didn't explain it hugely. So in other words, you have a poor quality diet, it's linked to increased hypertension and uh, weight and a whole range of cardiovascular risk factors, which then predisposes to depression. But what we've also found with this study, and we're just finalising the analyses now, is really exciting because it's the first time we've seen in humans what we've been seeing in animal studies for several years now. And that is dietary patterns are really clearly linked to hippocampal volume and hippocampal atrophy because diet has a very profound impact on BDNF, on the neurotrophins and on hippocampal volume. So in these older people, those who had higher intakes of Western food and or lower intakes of nutrient dense foods had smaller hippocampal volume and greater hippocampal atrophy over four years. So this is really interesting because there's a huge amount of research that's being done in animal models, but this, the human models are only just starting to, to be examined. And this is what we're doing with this. This is uh, hopefully published soon in PLOS One. So there's been many, many studies in adults. And I'll show you a couple of new papers in, in systematic reviews that have just uh, been published in the last month. Because of the early age of onset, I was particularly interested to look in adolescence. You know, what is the role of diet quality in adolescence? Often in adolescence, we find that's when they first start to have their own income. They can first start to go and hang out at McDonald's after school. And of course, the McDonald's are allowed to build a, 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 a takeout just across the road from the school because there's nothing in the planning regs that says that they can't. So we did a study with the Murdoch Children's Research Institute with George Patton's group and we looked at data from the Healthy Neighbourhood study which comprised approximately 7,000 kids from a whole range of socio-demographic backgrounds from right across Australia. From the data we had from them on their diets and their dietary habits and also uh, measures of adolescent depression, we were able to compile a healthy dietary score and an unhealthy one. The healthy one looked at things like do you have breakfast generally in the morning at home before you go to school? Do you tend to eat uh, fruit and, and bread and things after school or do you eat junk food? Uh, do you bring food from home? Is there fruit and vegetables every day in your diet? Those sorts of things. And the, of course the unhealthy one was takeaway foods and soft drinks and all of those sorts of things. Again, quite independent of each other. And we found very clear dose response cross-sectional relationships between their diets and their likelihood of adolescent depression. So those with the lowest intake of healthy foods and also those with the highest intake of unhealthy foods were much more likely to have depression uh, according to the um, adolescent depression scale. 
The interesting thing about this paper, even though it was cross-sectional, was that we were able to take into account a whole range of familial factors that were really important. So not just the, the familial uh, socioeconomic status and education level, but things like family conflict and poor family management that could reasonably be expected to be related to the quality of the diet at home and also the risk for adolescent depression. And these relationships existed over and above these things. These did not explain the relationships we saw. So then we went on and we did another a prospective study. And this was with the WHO Collaborating Centre for Obesity Prevention, with whom I do a lot of work. Some of you will, be, um, will know Boyd Swinburne. He's a very prominent public health advocate in Australia for obesity prevention. So these data were drawn from a study of approximately 3,000 adolescents in Victoria. And data were collected at two time points, roughly 2005 and then again two years later in 2007. So again, we had these two dietary measures, dietary scales, one measuring healthy food intake, the other measuring unhealthy food intake. Again, taking into account things like their levels of physical activity, the socioeconomic status of the household, etc we found again these very clear dose response relationships cross-sectionally so that those with the highest intake of unhealthy foods had lower scores on this measure of well-being, where higher scores meant the kids were better off. Those with uh, highest intake of healthy foods were, were much better off. But of course we wanted to know what happened over time. Does dietary intake at the start predict mental health two years later in adolescence? particularly once you take into account the mental health of the, the adolescents to start with, because that's always going to be the strongest predictor of their mental health two years later. <coughs> and indeed, we found that it did. So we lost statistical significance uh, with the unhealthy foods. So junk food, higher unhealthy food intake at the start was linked to worse mental health two years later, but not statistically significant, whereas healthy food predicted better mental health two years later, even after we took into account their mental health at baseline. What was really key with this study was that changes in diet quality were linked to changes in mental health over that two year period. So the kids whose diet quality improved, their mental health pr improved. The kids whose diet quality got worse, their mental health got worse. And these, these kids were pretty young adolescents, sort of 11 to 14 years. So they're in the process of making that transition into having their own income and their own ability to go to the shops and buy stuff. Um, again, we didn't find any evidence for reverse causality. The mental health didn't predict the diet, it was the other way around. So again, we have a whole host of data, and they, I've put three studies there, but actually there's since then been another, at least three in adolescence from right around the world, in, in Europe, in China, in Taiwan, etc. Thank you.